Good afternoon, friends and neighbors. Thank you very much for being here today. My name is Joey Yao. I am the director of the CLC Performing Arts Center, and it's my pleasure to coordinate the Cultural Thursday program. Um, before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the faculty and staff at CLC for supporting this program, as well as those of you who made the trek out today to attend. Um, if you have family or friends who would have liked to have been here today but were unable to do so, we are recording this event, and a recording of it will be up on the CLC YouTube channel at some time at the beginning of next week, so if you want to reference it. Um, we have plenty of room down here in the front. If at any time those of you who are able would like to come down, uh, you're more than welcome to. Um, for those of you CLC students who are sitting in the back or on the sides, tucked out of the way, I have asked our technical coordinator to rig some of the seats to randomly eject its occupants. <laughs> so roll the dice. Um, there will be time for questions during the program. If you have a question, since we are recording it, I would appreciate it if you would raise your hand, um, give me a moment to get to you, and hand you a microphone so that the people who are listening to the recording will be able to hear your question. Um, thank you for that. And with that, I am honored to introduce our presenter today, Reverend Dr. Stephen Newcomb. Pastor Newcomb is the founding director of the Kaleo Center for Faith, Justice, and Social Transformation and previously worked with the Minnesota Multi-Faith Network, the Bush Foundation, and the Headwaters Foundation for Justice. Today, we're pleased that Pastor Newcomb, we're pleased that Pastor Newcomb can share his work with the multi-faith, cross-class, and multi-race organizations, and movements striving for social justice across various sectors, including community, philanthropy, religious, nonprofit, and academia. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Stephen Newcomb. Well, thank you all. I'm very pleased to be here today, although I'm a little nervous about seeing students go popping up out of chairs <laughs> randomly during the presentation. <clears throat> I'm here today to talk with you about faith in public life. And this is the junction where one's deepest beliefs intersect with our shared common life. It involves individuals and communities of faith and conscience engaging in public discourse, advocacy, and action. Like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement, or local pastors and lay leaders addressing greed on Wall Street, or care for the homeless. I am the pastor of Justice Ministries at First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Brainerd. I am a Christian pastor advocating in public life I am not a pastor advocating for a Christian public life. I believe in pluralism and democratic participation by all members of our community. I live my faith in public, and I have faith in our public life together. My faith in public life is grounded in biblical scripture. There are many passages I could quote, and I have chosen today Mark, 12, 30, and 31. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, th of the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. For Christians, there is a no greater commandment. And I gotta be honest, I'm pretty evangelical about this one. I not only believe that I should love my neighbors, I believe you should too. Love of neighbor has many expressions. I am privileged to have been on this road for many years and I'm ha honored to share with you some of the stops along the way. Let me tell you about my trip. My travel on the road of faith and public life began my last semester of seminary when I attended a special program in Washington, D.C. at the intersection of theology and public policy. I came away from that experience wanting a deeper understanding of the public policy process, and so I then attended the Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs at the U of M. One of the surprising things I learned in this program was that every major denomination has staff in Washington, D.C. lobbying on policy issues, affordable housing, health care, tax policy, environmental protections, just to name a few of the topics. 
I also learned that they used a very specific process for engagement. And I think you will find their pastoral circle interesting. It begins with our lived experience and the question, what is going on? Let's take bullying, for example. As we share our own experiences, we learn that bullying can impact anyone. It's often associated with school-aged children and adolescents, but we realize in our conversations that it can occur in the workplace and among adults and in online spaces. Victims of bullying are at risk of increased depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. They also have lower academic achievement rates, are more likely to skip or drop out of school. And this investigation and our conversation about our own experiences with bullying help us understand its impact. This is followed by a deeper social analysis and addressing the question, why is this happening? As we dig deeper, we discover that 20% of students between ages of 18, 12 and 18 report being bullied in school, while 28% experience bullying online. LGBT students are, much more, are more than twice as likely to be bullied at school individuals with disabilities, social marginalization, or belonging to minority groups, those who are perceived as different in some way are at a higher risk of being bullied. The next task in this pastoral circle is the normative phase and it addresses what should happen. This draws upon our deepest values and convictions to guide our understanding of what the res fitting response is to this issue. And this is not just limited to religious people. It includes anyone reflecting on how their deepest values inform their decisions. Christianity centers around the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and the call to love of neighbor, and a consistent theme in both testaments about showing compassion and hospitality to those that we see as other. And finally, the action step. What are we going to do? Understanding the dynamics of bullying, the demographics of those most affected, and the demands of our faith informs our strategic action, our anti-bullying education, our creation of anti-bullying policies, organizing events and actions, or standing in solidarity with those who are impacted. Which brings us back to our lived experience, which provides an updated understanding of what is going on. This cycle is referred to as a praxis and represents an ongoing pattern of action and reflection. This cycle of experience, analysis, reflection, and action, I believe can be a useful tool for all of us. My first stop on the road of neighborly love was with the Greater Minneapolis Council of Churches. I directed the Senior Chores Services Coordination Project, which utilized neighborhood ecumenical groups to help seniors continue living in their own homes. One concern these neighborhood groups had was about addressing um, whole house painting. And since this wasn't a pro, uh, activity the local groups could take on, we launched what we called the Metro Painathon. This is a broad coalition of religious, corporate, fraternal, nonprofit, and community groups who formed teams to prep, prime, and paint a home that was assigned to their team. In the third year of operation, we painted 400 homes of senior, citiz senior citizens and disabled adults using 10,000 gallons of paint and 12,000 volunteers, basically all on one day. The teams would go out ahead of time and prep the homes, et cetera, but on the day of the event, teams would show up all over the metro. Uh, you couldn't drive anywhere without seeing scaffolding up all over the homes. And for me, this was a profound testament to the power of community. Building on the power of community, my next stop was with the Headwaters Foundation for Justice, a community foundation 
committed to grassroots social change. Headwaters was part of a 15 foundation network that operated under the mantra, change, not charity. These foundations were established by young adults with inherited wealth from philanthropic families, but whose worldviews had been shaped by the grassroots movements of the 60s, and they wanted to do philanthropy differently. The foundations were formed in partnership with local activists and shared several qualities. The first of which was that grassroots activists made up the grants committee, read the proposals, did the site visits, and made the granting decisions. Grants were directed to marginalized communities working to, at, working to change the underlying systems through advocacy, organizing, and movement building. Moving money to the community was a higher priority than building a, an endowment, and so it operated primarily on annual giving. And over the course of those um, 40 years, you can see that the annual giving has grown significantly. What began in the first year of giving was $100,000. Currently, Headwaters is giving away $3 million annually. We also built a $2 million fund of the Sacred Circle that was directed to, to supporting Native American organizing in both Minnesota and Wisconsin, and it was the first Native-run fund within a community foundation in the United States. We also built a $1.5 million endowment to cover administrative costs. The donor and pool included high-wealth philanthropists and low-income activists, literally Dayton's and Rockefeller's and Jones's and Smith's and Johnson's. The board's composition included a majority of people of color, black, Indian, women, and 25% LGBTQ. I learned several things at my time, the 18 years I was at Headwaters, the most important of which is life is abundant when everyone's invited to the table. Over that 40 years, Headwaters has granted close to $70 million. I also learned that diversity is a strategic advantage. We, as, as Headwaters became more diverse, we became better connected and more effective in our work. After 18 years with the Headwaters Foundation, I received a Bush Foundation Fellowship to explore justice education in theological contexts, seminaries and divinity schools at universities. I conducted 125 key informant interviews and did program analysis and curriculum review of 25 seminaries located in 11 metropolitan areas. Some of the key findings included that Justice education in theological contexts, and I actually believe in most contexts, is focused around issues and isms, or what I would call injustice education. We teach people what's wrong, but we've been less effective about teaching the tools to create what's right. No, no identified set of core competencies great at instilling a sense of ought, but we also need to know how to. And there's a lack of conceptual frameworks for how to do spirit-grounded, faith-based social transformation work. In 2010, I was invited to a faculty retreat at United where I shared some of my findings from my research. And this led, actually, to the creation of the Kaleo Center for Faith, Justice, and Social Transformation, which was housed at United, situated at the intersection of spirituality, the academy, and community. Kaleo Center worked to advance the theory and practice of spirit-rooted movements for justice. I was invited onto the regular faculty, regular faculty where I taught courses like Leadership and Strategies for Social Transformation and, this was a fun one, Blessed Are the Organized. <laughs> in 2016, I developed two new degree programs for United, an MA in Leadership for Social Transformation, which was a 48-credit 
spiritually grounded leadership program, and a Master's of Divinity and Social Transformation, which was a five-course concentration within the MDiv degree. I then served as a program director for the Social Transformation Project or program. Kaleo was also a multi-faith multi movement center. My co-director was Jewish, and the board was multi-faith. We hosted multi or monthly multi-faith gatherings with a healing justice lens. These, these offerings centered movement leaders from marginalized communities, sharing their work and strategies for change. We helped organize around the marriage amendment a faith table that opposed the constitutional amendment to define marriage between a man and a woman. The folks around this table affirmed that marriage is a holy union of love and fidelity and should include same gender loving couples. What was most astonishing about this work was who was at the table. This was the richest collection of faith traditions I had ever participated in. Marriage equality was legalized on August 1st, 2013 in the state of Minnesota. On August 9th, 2014, 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Missouri. Following this event, the Marriage Amendment Table of Faith Leaders became March, the multi-faith, anti-racism change and healing table, and adopted a spiritual practice deliberately of followership. That meant that we would act in accountable relationship to leaders of the movement for black lives. One activity of the March table was the creation of the Sacred Solidarity Network. This is a network of congregations that were committed to addressing racial justice. And last spring, the table released Sacred Reckonings, an educational resource and a reparations framework. During my time at Cleo, I also created Sevenfold, which is my social transformation framework. And I'm currently working on a book for Fortress Press Academic, and we're gonna come back to this framework in a moment. Last June, I retired from Cleo and shifted my attention to the Lakes Area Justice Table. This is an open table of congregations, nonprofits, and social action groups we are currently nine organizations, but the network includes hundreds of people who have not been in existence long, but they have been a busy group. In October, we hosted a curated viewing of art representing settler and native life to deepen our understanding of our shared history. In January, we collaborated and helped out with Joey in the production and the presentation of Connect Effect here in this theater. And in February, we launched our Show a Little Love campaign with a half-page ad in the dispatch, supporting our dedicated teachers and staff. This campaign will be an ongoing set of activities to support public education. Across these multi-faith, cross-class, multi-race, and cross-cultural experiences, I've learned a few things about inclusion. First and foremost, it is grounded in abiding relations, which require that we spend time together, that we learn about and from one another, and that we appreciate one another. This is the beginning point. It also requires truth-telling. We have to be honest with one another when hurt occurs, and we have to trust that our truth will be heard. We have to be honest in the present, and we have to be honest about our history. Why would an indigenous person or a black person trust me if I'm not willing to hear and speak the truth about our history of exploitation? Abiding relations require truth and trust. We must live up to our deepest principles and values. We cannot just say we love our neighbor and welcome the stranger. We must act lovingly towards our neighbor. 
Every faith tradition I know has at its core a tangible commitment to hospitality and welcome. Abiding relations require solidarity. And solidarity calls us to be with one another in many ways, as a trusted ally, as a shoulder to lean on, as one who is doing their own work, as a conversation partner, all the things you would do for our friend. And it requires forgiveness. This work across faith and race and gender and age and culture and identity is complicated. And we're going to make mistakes. But I believe if we act in trust and in truth, we can forgive one another as we forge our way together on this road of neighborly love. Abiding relations is the beginning point of faith in public life. But faith also requires other action. To understand, I want to talk for a moment about seven generic components of all human action. And to make it easier for us to understand this, I want you, each of you to imagine an activity that you love doing. What is the favorite thing you like to do? Now think about how you got into that. What launched that? Well, how did this begin? Can you do it anywhere, anytime, with anyone? Are there limits? What do you need to do this favorite thing? What resources are required? What human resources? What material resources? What form does this activity take? Do you do it alone? Do you do it with others? Do you practice? Do you perform? Do you have a schedule? How do you build it into your life? And what is the commitment and passion that energizes this activity? What motivates you? What amps you up to do this? What's the aim or the priority of your activity? What do you hope to accomplish? Do you want to be the best? Or are you doing it for fun? What's your mission? And what is the significance of your action? Why does it matter? What difference does it make to you if you do this? And then finally, fulfillment. How does it feel when you've accomplished this activity? I'm going to give us another way to think about these elements. I'm going to craft a love poem with you. <clears throat> we'll pretend we're writing a poem, a love poem, and we're going to look at each one of these components. So existence. We have a history and a relationship with the subject of our love. We have shared experiences. We remember when we met, how we felt, what we said, the plans we made and lived. This history holds deep potential for our love poem. It is the ground of our love. My love and its expression springs from this ground, yet this history and our existence also limits its expression. I cannot say that our love has endured the test of time if we started dating two and a half weeks ago. I also have a history of expectation of what a love poem should be and what it should do, which both limits and launches me as I craft my poem. What are the things I need? What are the resources I'll draw upon in the writing of my poem? I may use a pen or a computer, I might craft it on parchment paper, I might create a meme. I will use words or symbols, perhaps similes or metaphors to express this love. I might deliver it in person requiring the resources of speaking or send it by mail requiring an envelope and a stamp. I most certainly will, will make use of the resource of time as I write the poem. My poem will have a particular form. It may have the rhythm of iambic pentameter, or it might be free verse. It may take the form of a short haiku or a long ballad. Not only must my poem take some form to be communicated, 
The form I choose will affect its success. If I want to convey deep romantic feelings, perhaps a body limerick is not the best form. But if I want to tickle and humor and delight my love, perhaps that limerick is just the thing. And what is the power of my poem? It's twofold. It's the energy, passion, motivation, and commitment which, draws, which drives the writing of my poem. It's also the energy, passion, commitment, and motivation that's elicited in the hearer of the poem. The poem requires and generates energy and power when a hearer is moved. What's the mission of my poem? It may be to bring my lover to tears with the depth of my love or make her cry with laughter. It may be the need to say out loud what is deep inside and the mission to get it out, whatever the form. It may be, it may be to be a published author. And the mission of my poem is not just to express my love to my lover, but to capture some essence of love that can be shared and experienced by a total stranger. The meaning of our love poem is a measure of its significance to the hearer. I may write a poem which is grounded in our history, uses pen and paper, has the structure of a ballad, delivered with passion, with the intention of conveying the depth of my love, and it may completely miss the mark. I may not capture the incense of our love. It may come off as cheesy and sophomoric. It may lack significance and thereby fail as a love poem. Or perhaps the listener hears, even within my poor choice of words and rhythm, the meaning of my love, and despite its poor poetic form, understands the significance of my love. The completed poem is its fulfillment. It may be a bad poem, it may be a brilliant poem, but, it's a compl but a completed poem is a poem fulfilled. Its measure of fulfillment is found in the degree to which it successfully utilizes each of the features of human action. If any piece is left out, no poem is possible. Without existence, a history, or shared experience, I have no ground for my love. Without the right resources, words, or paper and pen, or the ability to speak, I cannot craft my poem. A poem without form, without some structured expression, cannot exist. If I can't muster the energy to craft my poem, it remains unarticulated. Without a mission to guide its creation, it becomes just random words. If my poem has no meaning or significance to the hearer, it does not convey my love. It fails to fulfill as a love poem. And if any one of these generic components or dimensions of human action is missing, my love poem is doomed to failure. In the same way that when you reflected on your favorite activity, if any of those elements were missing, you didn't have the resources or you couldn't structure it in, then that activity can't happen. Now these elements of human action can be organized around your activity. And these elements of meaning, mission, structure, power, existence, resources, apply regardless of what the activity is. That applies not only to your individual activities, but to social issues as well. If we go back to the issue of bullying, for example, we need to include all of the following dimensions that we talked about if we want to have an impact. We could begin right here in this room with your experience. I could ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been bullied or you know someone who's been bullied and you want to do something about it. You have a reason to care. You're already ignited about this issue. And then we might determine we need to educate and equip ourselves to be engaged in this work. So we form a reading group. We identify books and articles and organizations that offer other resources to deepen our understanding. And then we start thinking about systems. 
We discover stomp out bullying and tap into a whole network of resources. We build a Facebook page to keep ourselves connected and linked to other, and we link to other Facebook groups that are addressing bullying, especially cyberbullying. Working with Stomp Out Bullying, we organize a Unity Day event during which students and community members wear orange to show their support for bullying prevention. We also participate in the annual Run, Walk, Roll Against Bullying event, which helps raise funds for programs and services, and we are gaining members. We decide to become a chapter of Stomp Out Bullying and join with organizations across the country in support of the Tyler Clem Clem Clemente Higher Education Anti-Harassment Act. We believe in a world without bullying. We imagine a world of compassion and empathy, and we invite others to join us. I believe that social transformation occurs when we integrate all of these elements when we ignite souls, equip persons, forge systems, harness power, catalyze movements, and transform worldviews. Each of these dimensions has a particular strategy. And my PowerPoint quit working. Oh, here it comes. It was just slow. So there are strategies to do each one of these. There are encounter strategies to ignite souls. We do education to equip people. We do advocacy work to impact structures. We organize to harness power. We envision a shared future to mobilize and catalyze movements. And we proclaim new worldviews for people to see the world differently. Each one of these activities, each one of these dimensions and strategies produces a different kind of change. Encounter produces soulful change. Education produces personal change. Advocacy produces systemic change. Organizing, organizing generates political change, not in the partisan sense, but who has voice and who has power. Movement building is cultural change, and transformation and proclamation is about changing worldviews. And each one of these dimensions answers a different question. What is the experience and what is its history? What resources do we need to have an impact? What are the structures that need to be in place? What kind of power do we need? Do we need more people? Do we need expert power? Do we need to understand how the systems work? What is our trajectory? Where are we headed? And why does it matter? These seven questions address the, partic the particular activities that you thought about that were your favorite things, but these seven elements are embedded in every action we take, whether it's personal, or collective, and this provides a framework for us to both understand what's going on in the world around us and have avenues of impact. You may remember the pastoral circle from early on, began with experience, moved to social analysis, but here this framework doesn't provide any specifics. This is where sevenfold can be useful. In terms of doing social analysis, it provides interpretive frames. Each frame illuminates some aspect of the issue you're looking at. You could look through the lens of power and see who's in authority and who's motivated around this particular issue. But by doing that, you might obscure what is the structure or the resources that in play. So while each lens illuminates one component, it obscures the others because of that very illumination. Taken together, though, these lenses and dimensions provide the ability to reframe and look at an issue from multiple perspectives simultaneously. The framework can be used to describe a particular event or social occurrence. It can be used to analyze an issue, and it can also be used to evaluate how well you've done around each of these dimensions. 
moved on to reflection, which we talked about, but also this framework now provides avenues of strategic action, avenues that we're familiar with in other contexts, organizing and advocacy and education and encounter, things we actually know about and know how to do are assembled together in a framework that suggests that we begin with the promise that we serve in the middle and rotate clockwise, starting with proclamation, answering the question, why this matters, and then moving clockwise around, identifying the mission, the power needed, the structures needed to be impacted, the resources required, et cetera. That provides alignment of all of your activities around the central promise and it moves this from seeing these as autonomous strategies of education over here and advocacy over here into a comprehensive framework that integrates all of those components. We've come to the end of the road today. Thank you for joining me on this little tour. I hope it encourages you to step out on this road of neighborly love. And now I think we have time for questions. Lowell, we have one here down oh. the front. Joy, or do you have some the mic? Lowell, I've got the mic. All right. <laughs> um, Steve. I would like you to tell us a little bit about what and how we can be involved right here in River City. Well, there's a justice table you could sign up for. Um, there are all kinds of avenues and, uh, of engagement. The justice table is certainly one of them. And as I said earlier, it's an open table. People are invited to come. Um, it is comprised of organizations, but also includes individuals. Um, what I'm hoping is what this provides is a framework for wherever you connect or plug in, that you've got a framework to think about how we create the kind of change that we're hoping for. How do we assess what's going on and how do we make the decisions moving forward? Does that make sense, Jan? Or did you want a list of? <laughs> oh, Joy, Joy stole the mic and ran off. Be right back. <laughs> Um, Steve, as a person who's been um, limited in their theological orientation to Christianity, could you share some of what you've learned from other faith traditions that you've uh, worked with in, in your broad organizing work? You know, one of the, um, I, I mentioned I referred to it a little bit in, the, in this talk, but w one of the things that I'm com consistently astounded by is how deeply hospitality and care for one another is embedded in all of our faith traditions. Um, and w w one of the other things I learned working in those contexts is my own faith as a Christian deepened because of my relationships with Muslims and Jews and Unitarians and Quakers and Presbyterians <laughs> and the whole array did not diminish my faith but in very significant in, uh, ways deepened my faith. Um, and I learned one of the key learnings that I didn't mention was that my identity is not diminished when I affirm yours. Whether it's your gender or race or orientation or religion, affirming your identity doesn't do anything to diminish mine. And in fact, I think it actually deepens my own self-understanding. There's one in the front and then Tracy in the back. If I can figure out how to turn this on, I can walk around. A lot of the things that you mentioned here are, and a lot of the things talking about justice, those oftentimes were things that the church churches used to do. And now we've kind of, they've all spun off into nonprofits or NGOs or whatever, what is the role of the church mm. in all of these things? <laughs> well, I actually think the role of the church is all six of those things, about creating a shared vision for our world, about finding ways for us to work together towards a common goal, about 
utilizing the resources that are available. I think all of that is um, part of that work. Sort of lost the train of thought. Say your question one more time and I can. Well, I'm, uh, these are things that oh, the, the church. church has done historically and now we've kind of spun them off. So what is the church's role? Yeah. Oftentimes I think the church is looked to as the uh, source of all volunteers that we, we need in our public life. And, and that has been the case. Churches have started educational institutions and hospitals and libraries and all sorts of institutions. Um, and I think the church has a critical role to play in that. But I don't think the church's role is limited to generating volunteers for our public life. I think the church's role is also to say, some of these things need to be paid for by our taxes because we don't have enough volunteers. And that we need to be engaged in those conversations about what is sustainable, what is the church able to do. I, I don't know where you attend, um, but where I am, the congregation is getting older. And so it's the church's capacity over time changes. And so I don't think we can rely on it in exactly the same ways that we have. But I also think we can look to the churches for new ways to be engaged in public life and new ways for members of the congregations to be involved. Does that make sense? So I see your picture that you had that was put in the paper about supporting teachers. Oh yeah. What other kind of thing do you envision or have the other part of the community that you're associated with envision for the future of supporting uh, teachers oh. or other people that are okay. um, in struggling with acceptance and also with uh, other community struggles? Yeah. Um, we got involved with uh, uh, in doing the Valentine's Day ad because a number of folks who had joined the justice table had a long history of attending um, school board meetings and um, trying to support school uh, teachers and administrators and um, in some ways protect public education and as a core institution of our democracy. And so building on the folks that had history being there, we decided to sit down with the school superintendent, Heidi Hahn, and ask, how can we be the most supportive? How can we be the most helpful? And one of the things she said was that she has never experienced such um, demoralization among her staff and faculty. Folks thinking about leaving the profession because teachers aren't respected and there's what feels like a constant barrage of attacks on the school. And she said, well, it would be nice to, be, to hear from the public that we're appreciated, that school's important to folks. So the uh, group that met with her said, well, why don't we put an ad in the paper on Valentine's Day and show a little love? Um, now, the group that's gathered, there are eight or nine small organizations. We have zero budget. We have no money. And one of the members called the paper. It was going to cost $1,000 to put in the ad. So these nine folks or organizations around the table just reached out to their networks and said, we're looking for donations to underwrite this show a little love campaign and uh, we needed a thousand dollars within a week we raised two thousand dollars once again when everyone's invited we have abundance um, so that was the launch was the ad um, we're also now collecting names of individuals willing to attend school board meetings to speak at school board meetings to write to the paper and to write to school board members to express both their appreciation for their service but also express concerns about what decisions are being made and be supportive of an open and inclusive uh, educational environment. So we're, we're doing the writing campaign will continue. We have plans about a potential student essay about why they love their school that we would work with the paper to have published. Could do the same thing with teachers about why they love teaching. Um, and our, our intent is to continue to have activities that hold up and support public education. Oh, and we're meeting with school board members that are considering rerunning um, that we want to support, so we're also trying to do that work as well. Did that answer, Chris? Did I get at it, Tracy? We don't think this is a one and done deal. We're planning on being at the table supporting public education going forward. Is that right, Terry? <laughs> Terry's one of the guys that's been sitting at school board meetings for years. 
There's a question in the back, I think, John. Um, on that, do you have any students? You ever ask, like, high school students um, to get involved with your, um, with your, with, like, a club or something? You yeah. Know, like go it, raise money or something that could help for, you know, what they expect um, what they think of, you know, right. their opinions on the teachers yes. they have. Because sometimes they have good ideas. Sometimes? No. Lots of time, times. Exactly. Times. Absolutely. I mean, that's who you should be going after probably as a young kids. Yeah, we don't have any youth or uh, young adults at the table currently. Like I said, it's an open table. Um, so I'd love if you have suggestions of organizations or youth that might be interested. Or if there are any here that are interested, come talk to me. Other questions? I think we have one over here, Joy. Hi. In my experience, a lot of times um, causes get very caught up in the, um, the what we're doing and don't spend the, that time that you outlined on the reflection and and why we're doing it why and and are we continuing to do things right so how do you bridge that uh, that problem in your experience yeah I think part of the d dilemma is that we are all uh, want to move to action really quickly and oftentimes we move to action before we fully understand what the issue is so part of my hope is with the framework when we do the social analysis, we're using multiple lenses and we're taking our time to dig deep enough to more fully understand what's going on so that when we engage in action, it's the right action, it's strategic, it's focused, it's having the outcomes that we want, et cetera, rather than here's a problem, I know how to do X, let's do X to solve the problem. So I know how to do educational forums and so regardless of what the problem is, I'm going to do an educational forum. That's probably important, but it's probably not sufficient. So beyond the educational, what, are, what else am I going to do? How do I organize? How do we impact policy? How do we move in other directions as well? Does that make sense? In the future, I'll need everyone asking questions to please group together. <laughs> My question is, the framework seemed really well um, laid out, and I can imagine that there's a little bit of, it's not as neat as oh, what you, no. can, can you tell us a little bit about that process and how, how it can be a little messy? <laughs> Trust me, it's more than a little messy. <laughs> um, let me see if I can put this up. Oh, that's not what I wanted. It'll go through a process, maybe it'll come up. Um, I wanted to bring up the full image because one of the things it shows is while each of those dimensions has a particular color, they're, they're blurred to the colors next to them as it goes around, right? So the, the, the transition from education to systems is not uh, a clear-cut piece. Part of our education is understanding systems thinking and how systems work so that we can move in and operate successfully in that context. So th that's a, uh, an example of how one dimension sort of develops and undergirds the next dimension, um, but also shows th that they're blurry. The difference between advocacy and organizing is, uh, I can give you a list of the, the competencies and the activities of each, but they blend and overlap. Um, and often organizations intentionally utilize, and that's what I'm calling for, utilizing multiple strategies. So there's an organization in the state called the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition. And it is an advocacy body. It's the oldest faith-based um, public advocacy body in the United States. 
It's been around a long time, and it represents Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim perspectives where they can agree on issues of public policy. Um, they existed for oh, probably 10 years. In the time when, we, when religious leaders spoke, legislators listened. That's not as true today as it was in the 50s. And so the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition used to be able to just have its leaders, the bishops and the conference directors and pastors, say that we support this, this work around affordable housing that wasn't sufficient. And so 10 years into their work, they hired an organizer. And the organizers out working in congregations to generate people to go talk to their legislators about the policies that JLC support. So they both are using the top of the hierarchy of the church to, to push policies, but they're also organizing the grassroots when they realized their advocacy work wasn't, their education and advocacy work wasn't sufficient. They needed to add organizing to accomplish their mission. Does that make sense, Heidi? Oh, one other thing I just wanted to say that, that I learned in the multi-faith piece is not only has it deepened my own, but I think we make a mistake when we try to go to the lowest common denominator. And in my experience, it's a much richer environment where everyone is encouraged to sort of carry their own faith tradition into the room, and if they're doing the opening prayer, to pray within their tradition. And we understand that that's their tradition and not necessarily ours but that we affirm and welcome that. And we don't ask them to be a little less Jewish when they're in the group with us. Or ask me to be a little less Christian. No, what we're asking each to be, be fully Jewish, be fully Christian, and let's find the work on this road together. Yeah, Tracy. We welcome humanists as well. I, I, you know, I believe my definition of faith is about our commitment to what we are ultimately concerned about. And I believe all of us act in that way. All of us carry ultimate concerns that determine how we act, what values we're grounded in. And we may not call that faith, um, but I kind of would. Um, I think all of us are carrying these values and principles that are critically important to us, and we act on those, and I think that's a good thing. And that should be inclusive, not just people who self-identify as religious, but people of conscience, people that operate on their values. That get at it, Tracy? Okay. The love one another, you know, is a central point of all of our faith and re religion and even just humanist. But um, <clears throat> it's a really difficult time there right now. Um, what I've been working on it, with people that I don't agree with is to find one or two things that we agree on and try to build from there. But right now we have families you know, that aren't even sitting around the table from one another now yeah. because of the disagreements and uh, <clears throat> It sure would be nice to find a, a process. Um, you know, immigration, it, love your neighbor. Well, you know, now we have people that hate people doing what our country has always done, you know, immigration. We need solutions, obviously. Solutions have been brought forward in a bipartisan way and then shut down because it's a win, win or lose proposition now. And I, I, I would love to see us get beyond that. I think most people really want that would like to but they really do and so i think it's it's important that we all speak out and, and support that kind of movement correct the the loud voices are always heard more than the rest of us um, i have one just one final question um, i'm sure within this room there is someone who has an idea of creating something new that will positively impact their culture or community you have done that several times throughout your career. I wondered if you might have any parting words of wisdom no. for someone thinking of taking on a big task like that. <laughs> well, you've heard of the, the cutting edge of change. I like to refer to it as the bleeding, or the, <laughs> you've heard of the leading edge of change. I tend to refer to it as the bleeding edge of change. Um, I, this has been the most rewarding and fulfilling work that I could imagine. 
um, I say j jump in and figure it out as you go. I'm hoping that the elements I ident identified about structure and resources and mission and messaging could be helpful in that. And there are all kinds of resources you can uh, find on, on in terms of people and uh, internet, et cetera. But the biggest thing is you gotta have this courage to take the first step. And you'll mess up and then you'll learn and you'll take another step. And perseverance is important. And with that, that is our time. Please join me in thanking Dr. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Stephen Newton. And thank you all for attending today. Enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you back in April and May for our final presentations. Thank you.